And I get the privilege tonight, thank you so much for having me tonight, and uh, I think it's this week that we're starting the series of, of Real, Real Talk, am I right? Yeah. Yes, great, awesome, so no one stole my message yet, uh, so that's good. And um, I'm talking tonight about friendship. Who's got a, who's got a, who's got a, a friend? <laughs> just one, like just one's good start. Who's sitting next to their friend? Yeah, great, oh, awesome, lucky. Best friends now. And uh, so I'm talking about friendship tonight, and I've titled my message, A Better Friend in Seven. And that's not seven minutes, sorry, I'm letting some of you down, you're like, oh, seven minutes, great. No, seven points here tonight, so we're going to be here for the next 45 minutes. And no, but I want to talk about being a better friend, all right, and seven things. And um, what I'm going to do tonight is we're just going to look through the book of 1 Samuel and, and a little bit of 2 Samuel. And this is what I love to do. And, and the beauty of this is what I'm doing tonight is what you can do tomorrow morning when you wake up. And you can get just as much out of the Word of God from you doing something similar to this, just reading through the Bible and going, God, what is it? What, what are you showing me here? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to walk through, just, and we're gonna, we're, not the whole thing. There's not, 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 not like all of 1 Samuel and all of 2 Samuel, just little parts. And, uh, and we're going to learn from Jonathan and David. Everyone knows David, a little bit less known. Jonathan, right? But we're going to look at their friendship because they had one of the best friendships in the Bible. I'd say like this is one of the best examples for a friendship in the Bible. So are you ready? Are you ready to be a better friend? If you're sitting next to your friend, just say, you need to hear this. <laughs> so better friend in seven. Here we go. You ready? So op- if you open up your Bibles to f- uh, 1 Samuel 14, okay? And now When we start to read this, David's actually not in the picture yet. And I know you're going, well, isn't this a a talk about Jonathan and David and their great friendship? Well, yes, it is. We're getting there. But here's the thing. A strong friendship begins with strong individuals. A strong friendship starts well before the friendship starts. And so that's why we're starting before we actually even get introduced and before Jonathan and David are introduced. But friendships, hear this, friendships are similar to marriage in that if you're looking for someone to complete you, they'll only disappoint you. Any relationship, if you're looking for someone to complete you, like the, the classic line in movies, you complete me. Uh, it's, just, it's just not, if you're looking for that, you will, they will only disappoint you, right? Uh, 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 my wife, Beck, is amazing, but she will not complete me, right? I've got some great friends, but they do not complete me. I am complete in God alone, all right? So, so this, is, this is why friendships, we need to have a, have a look at the start and at the front end of this before we even start talking about friendships because strong friendships begin with strong individuals. So 1 Samuel 14, I love this. Uh, 1 Samuel 14, verse one, it says, one day Jonathan, the son of Saul, so Saul the king, right? The son of Saul said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So, so Jonathan is literally just sneaking out to kill Philistines. Just loves, loves to do it, loves, loves doing it. That's just what he does in his spare time, right? They're fighting a war against them. Everyone else is over here and he's like, we're sneaking out and we're gonna have our own, our own fight. Verse two, Saul was staying in the outskirts in the pomegranate cave at Migron, the people who were with him were about 600 men. Saul was cowering away as per usual, and his son Jonathan was out picking fights. Saul was cowering away with, with an army of 600 strong, and Jonathan was out picking fights with just one other guy. I love this. Uh, it's just like the movie Gladiator. I'm just like, it's just so immersed into it. Verse six, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. I love this. Jonathan's just saying, let's have a crack. Let's just give it a go. Let's just, let's just, let's, like, I have faith in God, right? I love that. Jonathan actually has faith in God. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Let's just give it a go. And then basically, they, it says in verse 13, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him. And they, and they meaning the enemy, fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. Sorry, this comes with MA, 15 plus rating. And that's the first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made. Killed about 20 men 
within, um, within half a furrow's length in the acre. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, among the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and it became a very great panic. Just because Jonathan and one other guy were out there picking a fight. And you're like, what does that have to do with anything? Jonathan, this is my first point. Jonathan was a beast, okay, in his own right. So like number first point tonight, be a beast, okay? Weird point, weird first one, I am promised the other six are just normal. But the first one, right? John, we, we, we think that oh, David was this great and mighty man and Jonathan just, just, just like rode on his coattails, just was a bit of a leech on the relationship, right? right? He's just this, no, Jonathan in his own right was strong, confident in God. He, 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 was, he was not secondary, you know, to, or lesser to David. He was strong and courageous in and of himself. So that's the first point, be a beast. It's important that we go back and we see this. You know, everyone praises David, but we see that Jonathan, in his own right, is strong, is confident, has faith in God. And here's the thing, David didn't complete Jonathan. Jonathan was already complete. He, all right, he, in his own right, he was strong, he was good, he was confident. And the great friendship that we find later on in this story was made up of two secure individuals. The best thing you can bring into your friendship is being confident, strong, and secure. Not being a leech, not sucking the life out, not looking for someone to complete you, right? Don't go there because that will just drain the life out of a relationship. The best thing you can bring into a friendship is you in and of yourself with God being strong, being confident, being secure. That will bring so much strength into a relationship. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron. And one man sharpens another. Plastic doesn't sharpen iron, right? Plastic doesn't sharpen iron. Iron will just literally cut straight through, tear straight through that plastic. It requires iron to sharpen iron. It requires two strong, confident, secure people to sharpen one another. See, the picture is, is that in a relationship, we're both, both, not one, but both able to bring encouragement, correction, challenge, a honing to the relationship, a sharpening to the relationship, a sharpening to one another. But also in the same breath, we're strong enough because we're able to receive encouragement, correction, to be challenged, to be sharpened in who we are. So my question is, are you iron in your friendships? Right now, are you iron in your friendship? Are you strong? Are you secure? And look, I get it. We all have our moments, right? And we're all, we're all human and we have our weaknesses. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying be perfect. But I'm saying in yourself, you know, the, are you bringing a strength to that relationship? Or, or are you, are you being, bringing a confidence to that relationship? Are you bringing a security to that relationship? That's point number one. So then we skip a few chapters to where we see these two worlds collide. I love this. And so this, just before this, uh, this is the great story where David has killed Goliath, right? And everyone's marveling, Saul's marveling at it, and Jonathan is there witnessing it all. He's just watching it. And David's giving this talk to Saul. And it says this in, in uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. It says, as soon as, Jonathan, uh, as soon as David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I love that. Like, he's, just, he's, he's seen David take down this guy, have this boldness and this faith. He's like, this is my new best friend, this guy, right here. The second point is this, in a, in a, in a, to, be a, to be a, have a great friendship, it actually requires some uh, admiration. Right. This is actually a really key thing is, is admiration. You know, there's, there's uh, 100% um, needs to be an element uh, in our friendship where we marvel at our friends. I, I truly believe for a really great friendship, there has to be this, this level where we marvel, where we really admire that person, right? Because it's iron sharpening iron right? So, so like, here's the thing. I actually think it's pretty healthy. I know a lot of people, we hear lots of messages about the comparison trap and, you know, things like that. But you know what? I think, look, just to go against that a little bit, I think it's pretty, I think it's okay to feel jealous of your friends every now and then. Totally okay. Don't stay there. Don't stay there. Don't be like, oh, I suck. You know, don't stay there. But if you're going at your friend going, man, they're awesome, then 
it's probably because they're awesome. And that's a great person to have in your world. If you've got a little bit of jealousy, a little bit of comparison going on, that's good. Because that means that you're partnering with somebody that is probably strong, that is secure, that is confident, that's going to be able to, to sharpen you. If you're not marveling, admiring your friends, then I would say that there's, there's, there's great, we can have all types of different friendships, but you need to find one or two people that you just admire and get around them and get in their world and go, yes, I want that. I need to be sharpened, man. I, I love their wisdom. I love their talent. I love their way that they do this. Whatever it is, I think admiration is so important. Befriend people that you admire. Get in the world of people that you admire. I love that. And then the second one kind of flows on from that. Admiration is important. Um, Sorry, I said the third one, right? The third one flows on from that. Admiration is important, uh, but also number three is commonality. Okay? So I think this is often overlooked and and contrary to popular i guess belief right now uniformity doesn't make a great friendship or great relationship this is actually the opposite <laughs> uniformity doesn't but commonality does and when I say commonality, I, I don't mean that we, we like all the same stuff and we finish each other's sentences. And like, I'm not talking about that. Like, sure, yeah, yeah, Jonathan and David had some commonality. They liked killing Philistines. That's probably the only commonality they had, you know, right? Like, uh, but David was a muso. We don't hear anything about Jonathan being a muso, right? So it wasn't based on that. Their commonality, their friendship wasn't based on we're on the worship team together. It wasn't based on, oh, we're in this department together. Those, those are important, right? I've got great friends that are, that, that are pretty similar, like interests to me, but also some of my best friends, I'd actually say most of my best friends are not gifted in the same way I am, interested in the same things I am, because it's not based on that. Don't, don't subscribe to the lie that, you know, to be a great friend, we just have to be on the same page about everything. Uniformity does not make a great friendship, but commonality does. And commonality, and what the commonality we see here is a commonality in faith in God, a commonality of purpose, a commonality of future. We're headed in the same direction, right? The Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. And everyone talks about that just being in, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships or whatever. But it's even in friendships, right? If you're unequally yoked, you will feel like, oh, there's this pull this way and I'm, I'm, I want to go this way, but everyone else is going this way, right? We've got to, again, please be friends with people that don't go to church. That's a must. Like, that's a guarantee. But you need to have a couple of friends in your world that you, uh, you admire and you have a commonality with. I'm going, we're in this for the long haul. Jonathan and David are like, man, we're in this together. We're going to fight these Philistines. We're going to take this. We're going to defend our country. They had a commonality together. So don't let the vo- your vocation or the things you do or your department or your team divide or dictate or decide your friendships, right? Um, but let your faith in God, let purpose, let your f- let future be- lead the way. Okay, so those three are the ones. So be a beast. <laughs> Number two, admiration. And commonality, all right, those three, we're nearly there. So a, a few verses later, we see the most, uh, one of the most incredible things, I think. 1 Samuel 18, verse 3 says, Then Jonathan made a covenant with David. A covenant, I love that, right? Because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he had on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. This is something so profound culturally in this moment, right? It's Jonathan was showing here that I'm humbling myself. Like David at this point, like so, so Jonathan is, is rightfully the next in line to the throne, right? Jonathan's dad is the king. There's lots of entitlement here. There's lots of, you know, reasons to be like, I'm better than you, so, you know, I'm above you. There's lots of that. But what does is, what is Jonathan do? He humbles himself. And he says, you know what, David, I'm giving everything to you. I'm going to serve you. A great friendship has that as one of its foundations, is a humility of going, do you know what, in this friendship, for you, I'm giving everything, everything I am. That, that, that picture of taking off the robe, taking off everything and giving it. It's like, I'm giving everything to you. I'm going to serve you. It's incredible. He's not asked to. Technically, he doesn't have to, but he does it. And then we see 
Uh, this is so reminiscent of what Jesus did in, in John 13, right? It says Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his garments, right? So again, culturally, Jesus is taking off the outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water in a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, the Son of God, on his knees. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet, and put, out his, uh, put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. This is, this is the picture of, of, of relationship and of definitely of a great friendship that we are serving one another. I'm given everything. I take everything off. All, all, all the things that might, might, you know, sort of speak to my title and how important I am and all of that, I'm taking that off. I'm humbling myself and I'm choosing to serve you. That leads to number four, which is compete for second place. Everyone's in a race for first place. We want to be number one. We want to outdo each other. All of that, right? But in a great friendship, to be a great friend, we need to compete for second place. We can often, in our life, we just get wrapped up in the world of just our thing and just, just, trying, to, just trying to get more and be more and all of that. But we actually need, in our friendships, they're going to be great. If we're going to be a better friend to the people around us, we need to compete for second place. You know, we love to be served. We love to be served by our friends. We love for people to sort of, you know, work around our schedule, right? But how often do we sort of, you know, throw it all off? No, I'm not going to expect to be served. I'm actually going to serve you. Actually, I'm going to sort of bend my thing around to meet your needs right now. How often do we serve? How often do we sacrifice and lay it down for our friend? Jonathan could have pulled the, my dad's the king card, he could have felt threatened even by David, right? Because David was anointed to be king over him, but he doesn't. He serves. He's not in a, he's not in a competition for, for, for kingdom. He's not in competition for number one. He's in competition for number two. I love that. Romans 12, 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. So me and Tony, we are, in, uh, we are battling it out who can show more honour to the other person, right? Outdo one another in honour. Compete for second place. When someone's like, Chris, you know, oh man, you're so good at that and blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh man, Tony, have you heard Tony? Oh my gosh, Tony is amazing, right? Outdo one another. Don't be like, yeah, I'm better than my friend or whatever. Like, no, outdo one another to give honour to one another, to lift the other one above you. That will lead to a great friendship. I heard someone put it this way recently. They said, our relationships work like this. So there's, there's you and me, there's me and Simon in our friendship. And I'm focused on pouring my cup completely out into Simon's life. And he's focusing on pouring out his cup completely into my life. And you're like, whoa, well, isn't everyone empty? No, God is there filling both our cups with his love. Pour it, just, just pour, pour out into your other, your friends serve, hold nothing back and don't worry because God's pouring into you, right? Number five is this, fierce loyalty. Fierce loyalty. 1 Samuel 19, 1 says, And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Okay, so this is where Saul's starting to go off the rails. He wants David dead. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told Saul, uh, sorry, told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. He's defending David. He's looking after him. He's, thre he's, he's putting his, his um, everything, his whole future on the line here for David. Verse four, and Jonathan spoke well of David. I love that. Everyone else is like, kill David. Saul's just sprouting all this stuff. But Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, right? Verse five, for he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. I love that. Jonathan went in to bat for David. 
when, it, when, when things weren't going good, when it wasn't convenient, when he, it probably would have been better for Jonathan. At one point, Jonathan speaks up and, and, and Saul's anger turns to Jonathan in that moment, right? But Jonathan sticks his neck out for David here. He spoke well of him. When everyone else is speaking trash about David and all of that, no, David, this, Jonathan is speaking well of him. He's speaking about what he's done well. He's speaking of his accomplishments, right? Speak well of your friends. Don't dwell on this. You know, we all, we're not perfect. We've all messed up. Don't dwell on that stuff. Speak well of them. He defended David. He risked a lot to stick his neck out for David. And this world is so divisive and it means it makes friendships so fickle in this day and age. But that's not the type of friendship that we can have and that we should have. It's not fickle. We should be fiercely loyal, no matter what comes. I'm not gonna be fickle. I'm not gonna bail on my best friends through thick and thin. I'm fiercely loyal to them. Speak well of your friends. Speak up for them at times. Defend them. Risk your street cred for the benefit of your friend. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Whoever covers an offence seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Come on, speak well. 1 Corinthians 13, you've heard this at many a wedding probably. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it's not proud. It does not dishonour others. If we love our friends, it does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. That is fierce loyalty right there. That is the type of loyalty that we are to have with one another. Let that, let that be the loyalty that we have in our friendships. Number six, I love this, present in trouble. There's so many verses, they're not just one I can talk about. There's so many verses where you'll find David in, in a moment. Saul's chasing him, he's fleeing. And where's Jonathan? Right there. Jonathan's in trouble. Oh, sorry, David's in trouble. Where's Jonathan? Right there, helping him. He was just present. He was there in the middle of it. And I love that there was, there was an open and an honesty, you know, between them. Sometimes... You know, we're really going through it and, and we don't tell anybody about it. And we're like, man, no one's here for me. And, but we're not being open and honest with people about where we're at. Like we've got to be good on that. But if your friend is going through stuff, be present. Yeah. Be there. Be there all the time, as much as you can. When David was really going through it, Jonathan came to him. He was there for him. He wept with him. When it all went pear-shaped, Jonathan was there. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. I love that I've got mates and we talk every couple of weeks on the phone, you know, really great mates. And it's awesome that we just catch up on the phone. But you know what? I love it. I, I love that I've got those friends even more when things are not going well, when it's really hard, when it's really rough, when it feels like I can't get through it and they can, they, they're there, they're present because a brother is born for adversity. I love that. Proverbs 18, 24, as we read before, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Stick, stickability. Have some stickability in your friendships. Be a sticky kind of person, right? And be there, be there. 2 Timothy 4, 9, I love this. Uh, this is Paul talking. He's speaking to Timothy. He says, do your best. So, so Paul's right at the end of his ministry, man. Like he's, he's about, he's, at this point, he's, when he's writing this letter, he's, he's not far away from dying, okay? And at this point, he's, in a, it's, he's gone through a lot and he's in a pretty rough time at this. And he says this to Timothy. He says, do your best to come to me soon. And he starts talking. He says, for Demas, in love with the present world, he deserted me and he's gone to Thessalonica. And then he says this in verse 11. He says, Luke alone is with me. Poor Luke, he's not enough. So he says, he says, get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful. Is there somebody that you can be like, get Mark. I need him. I need him right now. Call, I'm calling up Mark. Mark, can you come over, right? You might have a Mark. That might be your friend. That might be your bestie. But that, 
It's so good to have somebody. We've actually got to work at that though, to have one of those people that is there, that we're putting somebody in there in our world that it's just like, bring up the phone, get Mark. Come man, I need you. Timothy, come as quickly as you can, right? I love that. Present in trouble. And then flowing on from that is the last point. 1 Samuel 23 verse 15. It says, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David and strengthened his hand in God. So he wasn't just present, but he strengthened David in God. Now here's, here's one of the things I think we need to, we need to understand, especially in this, this climate, this day and age at the moment. Great friendships on one side don't just send thoughts and prayers. You know, ah, oh, sucks, man. <laughs> like, you know, it's not just like I'm praying for you. Like, it's not just from afar, right? We've got to be present. But also, great friendships don't just let the other person just vent and just stay there. Now, we're not saying that we go and do what Job's friends did, like they get a pretty bad rap. Job's friends just said all the wrong things at all the right, all the wrong times, right? Not great. They were saying, this is your fault. You've done something wrong. You've messed up. I'm smarter than you. You should be listening to me, right? Just, just not good. But we also don't just go the other string where we just let our friends just like, when they're going through something, when they're frustrated, when they're angry, when there's, when there's bitterness, we just go, yeah, you know, you, you do you. You know, it's okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. Just, you're right. A great friend actually sharpens, right? Iron sharpens iron. And we actually strengthen each other in God. There is a discernment that we need to sort of learn about when we should talk about things and when we should say things, all of that. I'll leave that up to you and the Holy Spirit. But we need to actually strengthen each other in God. There is a time as a friend when your friend is just going, oh, this and this and this, and you listen, you listen, you listen, and you go, okay, let's pray, right? Well, this is happening in God and God, but hey, Remember, God said this. This is what the Word of God says, right? There's a moment in our friendships where we just actually, and sometimes that takes some time to build into your friendships, to build that, that sort of culture and that climate, but it is so important. And that is what brought David so much strength. There's moments like this where Jonathan came to him and strengthened him. David's writing all the Psalms like, oh God, I just want to die. Like this is just so hard. And why was the reason he kept on going? Because he had Jonathan. He had a friend that was there that was strengthening him in God. There is a need for us to point each other back to Jesus sometimes, to pray, to encourage, to remind each other, to call out the greatness inside of each other, to remind each other, to even correct one another. There's so much we could probably pull from this, from this passage, but these seven, and there's, you know, there's seven things that, 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 that can help. But we see the culmination of all this in 2 Samuel 1 verse 25. It says how, and so Jonathan has died, okay? He's died in the battlefield and then, uh, David says this, he says, How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of a woman. Now, some people read that verse and they freak out. They're like, whoa, <laughs> what's, what happened? <laughs> what's going on? Right, or it just makes us uncomfortable, you know, like... But that word love is just, if you look into that word, it's not an erotic love. It's not a romantic love. That word, that word love there is actually used sometimes to, to explain God's love for us and also the love that we have for an, a one another, right? So that's the, that's the context of that, that love. You know, 1 Samuel 18, 3, 4, this word, same word love was used when it says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved, he loved him as his own soul. It's the same word love, right? He loved him. So it's the same type of love he loved himself with. Sounds familiar. So it's not talking about this erotic love, right? But what we see here is that there is a love possible within friendship that surpasses even romantic or erotic love. Now, here's the thing. People put this type of love on a pedestal, right? And all of that. And it's just like, oh, that's, that is what we're going for. But you know what? There is a greater love than that. There is a greater love. There is so many different words for love in the Bible. I, Go look at them. But this word love here, it's saying it's, it's this, Jesus would agree with this, right? That there is actually a greater love than that that we can aim for. There's a greater love that we should be aiming for in our friendships. It's the love that John 15 talks about. And he says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. That is the love Jonathan had for David. 
That is the love that undergirded this incredible friendship, was the love that's willing to lay down everything for their, for their friends. There is a love that is greater that we should be aiming for. That's the love that Jonathan had for David. That's why they, that's the, that's why they were able to build what they did because it was this love in the center of that friendship. That love is possible when we're confident and strong in who we are and we're not looking for someone to complete us. That love is possible when we're genuine in admiration for someone. That love is possible when there is a commonality in purpose and direction. That love is possible when we compete for second instead of first. That love is possible when we're fiercely loyal. That love is possible when we're present in trouble. And that love is possible when we strengthen each other in God. That type of friendship is possible. And you know what? Here's the thing in finishing. I found that before we get the gift of a Jonathan in our life, we have to be the gift of a Jonathan in someone else's life. If you are not being a Jonathan in someone else's life, it's, it's probably very rare, unless the good Lord bless you, to have a Jonathan in your world. And, and, and sometimes, and I've, I've had this as well, where I, I, especially through COVID, I don't know if anyone else was the same through COVID, man, I felt probably the most loneliest I'd ever felt, right? There was just, just so, everything had changed. Everything was so different. And I'm like, oh, I feel lonely. And some friendships had sort of changed and shifted in season. And I'm like, what's going on? And my wife said, you should, you should pray for friends. And I was like, praying for friends. Never thought I would have to pray for friends before. And I was praying and I was praying for friends and praying for this type of friendship, someone that's going to be there thick and thin, all of that. And I was so reminded and God said, you need to be that friend first. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, it's me. Like, I'm, I'm sad. I need somebody to like, and he's like, no, you need to be that friend first. You need to pick up the phone. You need to organise the catch up. You need to do that. If you want the gift of a Jonathan in your world, you need to be the gift of a Jonathan to somebody else.